Hello, this is Dr. Vicente Reyes, and we are going to have our second lecture in EDSS 279-379. The topic for this second lecture is teaching geography. In order to do this, I will be addressing one main question. How can I improve on my teaching pedagogy? In order to answer this question, I shall be going through three topics. First would be a quick review of what we discussed in Lecture 1. Secondly, we will be undertaking some exercises, some reflective exercises, in which we try to determine what characteristics make good teachers. And then finally, I go to this third topic, which is how can I demonstrate good teaching in geography? In our first lecture, we talked about the relevance and the importance of humanities in today's world. One of the quotations I ask you to reflect upon in lecture one was that of Horace Mann, who talked about how education is the great equalizer. Well, Horace Mann and his contemporaries passionately argue that schools could help promote literacy, eliminate poverty, hasten the assimilation of immigrants, and teach moral values, time discipline, and a hearty work ethic. These are very important tasks that teachers in the humanities should perform. In Lecture 1, I also talked to you about how on top of this tremendous responsibility that teachers in humanities have in ensuring that education is provided to our students, we also need to be aware that in our context, in Australia, we face several challenges. And the main challenge really is in relation to the unequal outcomes for students. We can see this in issues related to indigenous versus non-indigenous students, students who have parents who are professionals versus unskilled laborers. So when we reflect on these issues, one thing that I would like you to always think about as a teacher when you go back to schools would be this. Are our schools teaching through the teaching of humanities doing all of these? In other words, are we helping promote literacy, eliminate poverty, hasten the assimilation of immigrants and teach moral values despite the challenges that we face in the Australian context. Another point that I spoke about in Lecture 1 was the idea that geography can actually be used to improve society. Particularly, I emphasize the fact that it is learning how to think in terms of aerial distribution density, pattern, diffusion, and dispersion, and the relationship of phenomena in place and the interaction of places that is geography that becomes integral when we try to think about improving society. When we talk about indigenous and non-indigenous students and the education gaps that exist in Australia, this is a very relevant and pertinent issue that touches on geography. This book by David Harvey, in relation to spaces of capital, talks about critical geography. And in critical geography, it talks about how, um, through it, we are able to recognize emancipatory politics that depend crucially upon the ability to articulate geographical alternatives in both theory and practice. The point that I'm trying to make is that when we take a look at education, we cannot turn our eyes away from the very real issues in terms of unequal outcomes, unequal access in our schools that have a direct bearing on geography and on the politics of place. The other point that we spoke of in the first lecture was the idea of reflection. If you remember, I argued that um, myself, together with uh, the other team of uh, teachers 
helping out in facilitating EDSS 279 and 379 should be seen as your critical friends. Our purpose is to provide you with uh, ideas to provoke you into thinking and into succeeding in your efforts to become educators. In doing this, one of the key ideas is the notion of reflection. This is our shared objective, reflection in action, reflection on action, and most importantly, reflective practice, which is the capacity to reflect on action so as to engage in a process of continuous learning, which is one of the defining characteristics of professional practice. In the first lecture, I spoke about my continuing engagement with research related to teacher burnout. And one of the hypotheses that I still am pursuing and I'm really pretty convinced about is the idea that if teachers lose the sense of continuously learning, of becoming reflective practitioners, then they're prone to experiencing teacher burnout. Let's move on to the second topic. We've already reviewed the key points of lecture one. Let's now move on to the second topic of, uh, of this lecture today, which is the idea of uh, what characteristics determine a good teacher. So here I have this table, which essentially outlines components of a typical teaching day. These are actually pedagogical practices that are reported by teachers. On one column, I have primary school, and on the other column, I have secondary school. What I'd like you to do now, very briefly, is to take a look at each of the pedagogical practice, for example, management of student attention and behavior, the first one here, and then score it from one to five. One being the practice that is least employed or least used, and five, which means that this is a practice that is widely used in the school, in your experience, from what you remember, right? So again, try to score, try to score from one lowest, five highest, um, which means this particular practice is employed a lot, that's the score of number five, for each of this practice, management of student attention and behavior, how would you score that? Structure and clarity, how would you score this? The use of drilling and worksheets, how would you score this? The use of pacing, pacing which means uh, a teacher knows that in a particular classroom, some students work a bit fast, some students work faster, and some students work at at their own pace. So pacing means the ability of the teacher to be able to determine how to pace their students. Wait time. How often do teachers wait when they give a question or when they um, ask the students to undertake an activity? Reviews. How often do teachers review lessons that have been covered? How often do teachers provide feedback? How often do teachers do face-to-face -face lectures? In terms of memorization, how often is this pedagogical practiced by teachers? Significance and meaningfulness. How do they relate their topics, the ones that they teach? How do they bring out the significance and the meaning of these subjects to their students? Do Teachers engage in the pedagogical practice of exploring depth of understanding. How about classroom discussion? Is this particular pedagogical practice employed a lot in your experience, in, in your prax experience, or maybe when you were employed as a relief teacher, or if you had no experience, if you have no experience teaching as of the moment, as of yet, perhaps you can recall what was the pedagogical practice in relation to classroom discussion in your school. Was it something employed a lot, employed rarely? If it's employed a lot, that would be around three, four, or five. If it's used rarely, then it should be two or one. How about connecting this to the real world? How often do your teachers 
try to connect the subjects to what's happening in the real world. Textbook focus. Is this pedagogical practice employed widely in your experience? The integration of knowledge, putting together not just, for example, geography, but also maths, um, science. Do your teachers, or do you as a, as a beginning teacher, uh, employ this particular pedagogical practice. Finally, creativity and criticality. How often do primary school teachers, because this we're looking at primary schools here, how often do primary school teachers employ creativity and criticality in their teaching? So score them. Score each of these rules from 1 to 5. Okay. I think you've made uh, your scores. Now let's take a look at the results of a survey that I conducted in relation to these questions. As you can see, this particular research I conducted a couple of years back in a different context in Singapore, to be more precise. And here I have in this table for primary school, I had 2,139 teachers and these were the scores that they that that were registered in relation to the pedagogical practice now let me clarify that for this particular research that we undertook what we basically did was we trained qualitative researchers and then we sent them out into classrooms and they observed a total of 2139 teachers and they were trained in order to identify what particular pedagogical practice was being used in the classroom. So this is what our um, qualitative researchers uh, were able, this is what they were able to produce, um, a picture of what happens in primary schools. If you notice, management of student attention and behavior scored the highest mean score, 4.53 out of a total of five, and creativity and criticality scored 3.27. It had the lowest mean score. This is very important in the context where we undertook this research. I don't know if you're aware, but Singapore, the Republic of Singapore, uh, it's, a, it's a relatively small country of about 800 square meters. It's one of the best education systems in the world. When you take a look at the uh, scores in PISA, when you take a look at the scores in TIMS, T-I-M-M-S, when you take a look at the scores in P-I-R-L-S, these are all high-stakes, international, highly regarded tests. Singapore is always at the top. So in terms of these high-stakes tests, students in Singapore score really high. But in terms of creativity and criticality, as this survey that we undertook proves, we see an issue. We encounter issues because the students don't seem to, to spend a lot of time in, or the teachers don't seem to spend a lot of time in engaging in pedagogical practices that nurture creativity and criticality. We believe, the group of researchers that I was a part of, we believe that the focus on exam testing, the, the, the very strong focus nationally in the entire nation is really um, engaged and really almost fanatically crazy about it could be one of the reasons why teachers don't really spend a lot of time in making creativity and criticality an important aspect of their pedagogical practice. I have another question to ask you. We have just looked at pedagogical practices. We have if you did the exercise, you would have scored um, what you believed were pedagogical practices employed in Australian classrooms. And I showed you results of a national survey. We, we did our survey of the entire nation of Singapore. So the sample of 2,000 primary school teachers, that's a representative sample. In other words, that sample, we are pretty confident that that is representative of the entire population of teachers in that country. In that particular survey, we also asked them this question. What teacher characteristics correspond 
to pedagogical practices. Given a set of choices, how would you rank these characteristics in terms of how they impact pedagogical practices? So I would like it to rank from one, being the least impactful characteristic, to five, the characteristic with the greatest impact on pedagogical practices. What are these characteristics that we're trying to rank? Number one would be teacher qualifications, certificates. Second would be teacher experience, work experience particularly. Third would be teacher age. Is a teacher a young teacher? Is a teacher a veteran teacher? Fourth would be teacher commitment, the passion of the teacher. Fifth would be teacher efficacy, the belief in one's ability. So I'd like you to think about it now. Rank what you think would be the least impactful to the one that has the greatest impact. Which one, which characteristics has the least impact, which one has the greatest impact to pedagogical practices? Okay, I think you've done that. Now let's move to what the results of our survey provided to us. This is an example of a correlation table. And uh, in order to read this, what we need to take note of is uh, these are the pedagogical practices. And they're divided into three categories. One would be knowledge classification. The next one would be direct instructional behavior. And uh, last would be classroom organization activities. These are the pedagogical practices. Now, these are the characteristics for primary school teachers. This entire block pertains to primary school teachers. This one pertains to secondary school teachers. This would be qualifications, experience, age, commitment, and efficacy. Now, these were the number of teachers who responded to the survey. We have 2,121 for qualifications, for teacher efficacy about 2,139. Right, so the reason for the differences here is that we had such a large survey. And if the teachers who participated in the survey failed to answer the questionnaire completely, then we had to discard uh, that particular survey questionnaire. So. There, there was some attrition in, in, in the survey results that we have. But again, we're pretty confident that uh, the results are a representative of the national population of teachers. Now, how do we read a correlation table? So we, for example, if we take a look at qualification and creativity and criticality, this one. So we take a look at where they intersect. This is where they intersect, qualification, creativity, and criticality. And when we see this number, it tells us it's negative 0 0.06 and then there are two asterisks here this means that um, if you take a look at the notes here it means that it's uh, statistically significant at the 0 0.01 level so keep it really simple all these correlation coefficients these numbers are called correlation coefficients the only ones that we should really pay attention to are the ones with asterisks either single or double asterisks because this means that the correlation coefficient, this number here, is statistically significant. In other words, it's not due to chance. It's not due to some random event. So for creativity and criticality, this is a statistically significant correlation coefficient. More importantly, it tells us that educational qualifications of the teacher is negatively correlated to creativity and criticality. The more qualified a teacher is, that particular teacher's pedagogical practice of creativity and criticality is negatively, negatively related to qualifications, right? Now, if we take a look at all the correlation coefficients, which ones do you see are the highest correlation coefficients? For the primary session, I think it's pretty obvious that uh, in this particular row, 0.49 is the highest, in the second row, 0.47 is the highest. And if you just scan this, you will see that the characteristic of teacher efficacy 
is the one that has the highest correlation coefficients and they're mostly or all of them are statistically significant when we take a look at correlation coefficients the rule of thumb is that it should be bigger than 0 0.30 if it's bigger than 0 0.30 then we can say confidently that uh, this particular variable or factor and that particular variable there something is truly going on between the two there really is correlation that's existing that's happening between the two so when we take a look at that question again which particular teach characteristic influences or impacts pedagogical practice our survey results tell us that it is efficacy that is the biggest predictor second will be commitment and um, we could see that in other cases it would be experience. Qualification, surprisingly, has, um, has negative correlations to pedagogical practices. Now, the implication of this is that the more highly educated the respondents are, the, our teachers, what happens is that they don't seem to be using this pedagogical practice. What is most, what is positively related to qualification is this one lecture point 10 but when you take about when you look at wait time it's negatively correlated pacing negatively correlated everything else seems to be co negatively correlated integration isn't but it is not statistically significant there are no asterisks there so we don't even need to consider that seems that uh, the highly qualified teachers at least in a Singapore context prefer to do lecture instead of actually doing all sorts of other meaningful pedagogical practices. If you take a look at the secondary level, we, we also see the same picture. Teacher efficacy is the important characteristic that determines pedagogical practices. Now, this particular result should not be a surprise because people have already identified how important teacher efficacy is. Now, this is Megan Chanin Moran, a good friend of mine, who is based in the College of William & Mary in the United States of America. And she was the, one of the pioneers of uh, this particular construct, teacher efficacy, capturing an elusive construct. This article that she co-wrote with Anita Wolfo Oi in 2001 is one of the most widely quoted papers in relation to the subject of teacher efficacy. Now, for Chanel Moran and Anita Oi, they described teacher efficacy as uh, a construct that can be broken down into three sub factors. First would be efficacy for instructional strategies. In other words, teachers are confident in their abilities of what types of teaching methodologies are appropriate given the situations that they face. Efficacy for classroom management. These teachers are also aware of what to do in order to handle uh, discipline, order, procedures in the classroom, and also efficacy for student engagement. Not only do these teachers have the capacity to use different instructional strategies and techniques in order to manage the classroom but they actually also know and are confident of what to employ in order to engage their students one of our goals at least for me uh, for our pre-service educators doing EDSS 279 379 is for you to be able to embrace the notion of teacher efficacy this is particularly critical in an Australian context where what we see is that the curriculum seems to be changing quite frequently. Now, if that's the case, if teachers do not have a strong sense of efficacy when the curriculum changes, these teachers could be confused because they might believe that um, the way for me to teach is to follow what the textbook says, what the syllabus says. There's nothing wrong with that, but if the syllabus and the textbooks change so frequently, and if the changes are dramatic, 
that could really put a lot of our teachers in a bind. What is most ideal, what is the best scenario, would be for our teachers, such for you, to be confident about your instructional strategies, about how you manage the classroom, and about how you can engage students. In other words, the syllabus, the curriculum, these are tools that you can use, helpful tools, when you go to the classroom. But um, based on my experience, I think the most important aspect here is to, for teachers to be able to take a look at the context that they face, because really, um, if you go to a school in the rural areas, in the Northern Tablelands, or even in, in the central coast of Australia, they will be very different from schools in the metropolitan places, in Melbourne, in Sydney. To say otherwise, I think, is really um, not being true to oneself as a teacher. So the point is, uh, one of the main messages that we'd like to um, impart to our pre-service educators is to be able to embrace teacher efficacy. Speaking of curriculum, just take a look at the situation we face in HISI, human society and its environment. We're in the midst of change. In 2013 and 2014, uh, that was uh, two years ago, uh, schools will continue to use the New South Wales K-6 HISI syllabus as above. Uh, in 2016, schools will start teaching the new History K-10 syllabus. Um, the new History K-10 syllabus will replace the current change and continu continuity strand. But schools have the option of starting to teach the new syllabus in 2015. That will be this year if they choose. In other words, there's really a lot of uh, discretion that's given to schools. And the ones who I think really suffer most are our teachers. You are trained at the University of New England School of Education to embrace a particular curriculum, but when you go to your schools, you might be asked to teach a different version of the curriculum. So in these situations, I believe that the most important characteristic that teachers should possess is teacher efficacy. What about teacher passion? It's also important, but when it comes to actually employing pedagogical practices. The survey that we have undertaken tells us that teachers believe that it is actually efficacy that matters most. We go now to the third part of this lecture in which I attempt to show you an example of a good sequence in geography. I think part of uh, teachers sharpening their skills, their repertoire of skills to become more efficacious teachers, part of the requirement is for us to be vulnerable, for us to allow ourselves to be seen by colleagues to see how we teach so that we learn from them. So here, I am, I created this own, this sequence, and uh, I I'm really keen on getting feedback from all of you, pre-service educators, um, teachers, fellow teachers, fellow educators, so that we could improve this particular sequence. I was just thinking that if I were a geography teacher in the school, I think that uh, I'm going to employ this particular case, this particular lesson. So my topic is about coastal areas, typhoons and mangroves, a case study of Tacloban City, the Philippines, my, my home country. So the concepts I'm going to look at will be place, space, location, pattern, spatial distribution. I'm going to employ several perspectives, a spatial perspective, an environmental perspective. For a spatial perspective, I'm going to see whether my students can identify mainland and island nations in the Southeast Asian region. This is an important region to Australia. And there are other questions related to special perspectives. I will also be looking at uh, 
awakening in my students, um, environmental perspectives, opportunities and constraints that uh, are available to coastal areas and what they provide for human life and economic activity. So I have activities in which I will be employing Google Earth and I have some questions, exercises. I actually have six exercises here. First will be identifying countries that are in the Asia-Pacific region. Second will be estimating distance between Sydney and Manila, first by integrating mathematics and then by using Google Earth. And then I locate the following bodies of water, north, south, west, east, in relation to Tacloban City. And then I estimate the distance between the multipurpose hall located in Tacloban City and my ancestral home there. And then I talk about typhoons. These are tropical depressions. These are storms on populated areas such as Tacloban City. How do they impact the culture? And then I'm going to be using uh, this super typhoon called Haiyan that essentially ravaged Tacloban City couple of years back and I'm going to talk about um, the impact that it has on populated areas. Questions to investigate, how has the coastal area of Tacloban City affected the inhabitants in the past and today? What relationships exist between the inhabitants, the coastal areas and weather patterns? Why is the sustainability of the mangroves important for everyone? So this is actually targeted for upper primary level students. Let's take a look at what uh, I intend to do. So I would show this particular slide and I have used pins on this big map here and I will ask the students to help me identify uh, what countries are pinned for number one, number two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So if I magnify this a bit, the global city is right there. This is the Philippines. I'm going to ask the students to identify what country this is. Number one. I think you all know that this is the upper bite of Australia, right there. And then I'm going to ask students to identify country number two, which is right on top of Australia, right there. And then I'm going to ask students to identify country number three right here, just at the south of the Philippines. Then I'm going to ask students to identify country number four, the western part of uh, number three. Then I'm going to ask students to identify country number five, right here. And I'm going to ask them to identify country number six. This is already, as you can see, this is already mainland Asia. And then country number seven, up here, in the northern part of the Philippines. So I'm going to use this in Google Earth, but I'm also going to provide students an opportunity to um, address these questions, to be able to answer these questions, because I will allow them to use, in my scenario, in my classroom scenario, I will allow them to use the computers. And in that way, they could use the internet to source and find out what these countries are. Ideally, there should be group activities so that the students are able to exchange ideas with one another. And then here I attempt to integrate uh, maths with geography. So I will tell my students that I travel frequently from Sydney, right here, to my home country, Manila. Manila is uh, several, uh, almost a thousand kilometers away from Tacloban. So I need to fly first to Manila, and then I travel down south to Tacloban. So I will tell my students, it takes me around eight hours to travel from Manila to Sydney. And then I will tell them, if the average speed of a commercial plane is about 805 kilometers per hour, how far is the Philippines from Australia? Would you be able to help me answer that question? This is the pedagogical practice of wait time, which I'm not very good at. So I'm going to move to the next slide. And here I'm going to use Google Earth 
to actually draw a line from Sydney all the way up to Manila. And using Google Earth, if you've already used this, you can actually see that there is a distance that is recorded, 6,307.31 kilometers. And if you did the calculation earlier, you would have uh, arrived at approximately similar figure. So that's an activity which integrates uh, some form of mathematics with, uh, with geography. And here, I'm going to focus now back to my home country right here. This is a magnified view of the Philippines. The Philippines is an interesting country because it has 7,000 islands. It's the second biggest archipelago. Indonesia is the largest archipelago with 14,000 islands. So here I would tell the students, I would ask them, showing them this figure, can you identify at least three bodies of water around my ancestral town? So here they will see Visayan Sea, uh, the Tanyon Strait, the Panay Gulf, Sultan Bank, Sultana Shoals, Butuan Bay, Bohol Sea, Cebu Strait. These are all, of course, bodies of water, but they are, they are named in different ways. Some are called Gulf, one is called a Bay, one is called a Strait, Bank, Shoals. I will, and there's one here, the Emden Deep, which is where the Mariana Trench is located. So this gives me an opportunity to explain to the students that when we talk about bodies of water, there are many ways of describing them. And in this particular map, we could see that uh, because it's an archipelago, meaning there are so many islands, there are bodies of water that are located in between them. Then I will move on to tell my students that this is the multipurpose hall in the city of Tacloban. And then this is my house right there. I will tell them it takes me around 10 to 16 minutes to walk from the multipurpose hall to my home. And if the average speed of an average adult is 80 meters per minute, how far is the multipurpose hall from my home? Again, manifesting my poor skills of wait time, I move to the next slide. Employing Google Earth again, I draw a straight line and I'm able to actually compute 1.28 kilometers as a distance between my house and the multipurpose hall. So, now I move on and introduce um, something related to weather that has an impact on geography. Hello and welcome back to CNN Newsroom from CNN Center in Atlanta. I'm Jonathan Mann and we are following a major story out of the Philippines, a major storm, a super typhoon barreling across the central islands. The storm is, well, it's a beast, and it is putting a lot of people in danger. Super Typhoon Haiyan packing winds of more than 300 kilometers an hour. The big worries are flash flooding and mudslides and landslides and the damage that wind can bring as well. Tom Sater is following the path of Haiyan and joins us. Now, what are you seeing? Jonathan, uh, the uh, members of the CNN World Weather Center are about ready to make a, a very strong statement. Based on the winds, as you see here, we know this has been the strongest of the year, and we know it's been one of the strongest in uh, recorded time. But based on the winds and the last advisory from the Joint Typhoon Warning Center, if the system did not weaken at landfall, which we believe it did not weaken, most likely Haiyan is the strongest tropical system based on the winds to ever make a landfall anywhere in the world in recorded history. Now, it's going to take some evaluation. There'll be weeks, and they're going to be studying this. Meteorologists around the world will study this storm for weeks, but we can pretty much safe to say, based on the winds, this could be the strongest we've ever seen. The eye making its way now very close to the heavily populated area, a city of Tacloban City. Again, 221,000 live there. You can see the eye as it's passing 
just to the south of the city. We get in a little bit closer, and you can start to see we had some winds at 155, but the strong winds, over 300 kilometers per hour, most likely will not be recorded because the anemometers that record winds break and winds that strong. I want to take you and show you the latest on the radar. This is out of Cebu, which, by the way, down to the south and southwest uh, is about 2.6 million in capacity as far as their population. Here is right here, this little finger here. Here's the hand. This is where the city of Taklaban City is. This is where our Andrew Stevens is. They are just within a few kilometers of the eye. Most likely, they will not experience light winds. In fact, they're in the strongest winds that this typhoon will provide. They're in just the, the wrong area right now. When you have a circulation with an eye making landfall as it makes its way in one of this magnitude, this is the area of concern in that northern quadrant as the system moves from areas of the southeast up toward the northwest. Because he is not in the eye, he will not have the light winds. He will not see the sunshine, which is most likely occurring inside the eye wall. There may be birds flying around. But on the exterior, he's in some blinding rainfall right now, and the amounts will continue to be quite heavy and staggering. Notice the convective activity as it wraps around the eye wall, off toward the southwestern flank down to the south. We're going to continue to see this make its movement across one populated community after another. It's going to take a while before it makes its progression and makes its way all the way through. About 18 hours, maybe only about 16 now. But this is the area of concern for all the cities and the communities that it will pass by. The other factor is what else can we compare this to? Super Typhoon Bhopal. 1,900 people lost their lives when Super Typhoon Bhopal moved in to Mindanao. It was the first Super Typhoon. It was last December. 216,000 homes were either damaged or destroyed as this young girl went to look for water. They had no running water, no electricity for uh, 10 to 11 months in some cases. Thousands lived in shelters. Here is what we're looking at and the progression of the storm. We did not see the storm weaken. In fact, it's unfathomable the strength that it continued to keep as it moved across the warm waters. Typically, we'll see the ice start to wobble. Watch what happens. As it makes its way into South China Sea, notice how it starts to wobble. Typically a sign, what we call a, an eye wall replacement cycle. Maybe it's, it's losing some strength. After that little wobble, it picks back up again and will continue to be a powerful storm moving toward Da Nang in Vietnam. The winds, notice the color of magenta. These are strong wind gusts over 180. So it's not just the winds, Jonathan, the rain. It's the threat for mudslides. Again, nearly 25 million people in the path for the next at least 16 hours. So I will show that particular video, that short clip, to students and they will realize, they will be introduced to the notion of uh, typhoons, but not just typhoons, but actually super typhoons. And um, then some of them might recall, if, they, if they're upper primary, they would have recalled it a couple of years back, this super typhoon Haiyan essentially destroyed um, the central part of the Philippines, my, my ancestral town. Then I'm going to show uh, to the students this picture of Tacloban City before Super Typhoon Haiyan. In my home country, we called this typhoon Yolanda. It's a female name. And then after that, I will show them the picture of Tacloban City after the typhoon. Let me just go back to this one. So this one was uh, February 23, 20. This one, there you go. Uh, November 11, 2013, just a couple of days after the super typhoon. If you notice, if the students will notice, all the colors of the houses have disappeared. Everything was basically destroyed. And the phenomenon that we can talk about here is what is called a storm surge. And I can uh, tell them the experience of my relatives, of my good friends, of, of how most of them suffered a lot when the storm surge occurred. So essentially, the storm surge, imagine the winds blowing through the body of water here and essentially lifting the entire bay, part of the ocean, and then covering the entire city of Tacloban. That's why there was utter devastation in the city. I could tell them uh, horror stories of... Uh, what has happened to some of my relatives, but of course, since our students are relatively young, um, I will tone down the 
the stories, but just explain to them how serious that particular uh, catastrophic event was. Um, on a personal note, um, I actually lost several members of my family to this storm. It was, uh, it was devastating, and uh, up to today, we are still um, grieving for the loss of very young kids who were swept by the storm surge. Here, I can now move on and introduce the notion of mangroves. And I will do that by talking about um, the Cloban City here and General MacArthur, uh, another small town, which is, if you notice in the map, is actually further east, much closer to the ocean compared to the Cloban City. Now, the reason I'm going to do that is because of something very, very relevant. Here, you see the Cloban City. This is San Pedro and San Pablo Bay. This is basically the, the, the waters here were the ones that covered uh, the Cloban City. And here is General MacArthur. And one particular town there had a, quite a unique experience. So the distance between the Cloban City and this town is about 59 kilometers. Nature, as shown by the super typhoons that ravaged the Philippines, could be treacherous. But nature, through environmental conservation, can be used to protect man from cruel elements. David Lozada reports on how mangroves prevented the high end storm surge from inflicting further damage on a coastal town. This is the coastal town of Palumpon, Leyte. The sea is calm, but residents know it can be treacherous. A resident here for 15 years, Leticia Sumili, says the sea can sometimes turn against them. When Super Typhoon Yolanda made landfall, the sea swallowed most of the shanties along the coast, including Leticia's home. Pasalamat po ko sir sa ginuungan, giluwas miniya kay hindi ko man hitubo man ang dagat dere. Kay ingon na ay ka ng tidal wave, ingon nila, di dagantanan sa simbahan. 80% of Palumpon's infrastructure was destroyed but the damage could have been worse. Like many coastal towns in the Visayas, Palumpon faced the danger of being wiped out by storm surges when Super Typhoon Yolanda struck in November 2013. But those mangroves protected the residents from total destruction. Some residents died from illness and falling coconuts. No one died from the storm surge. The town's mangrove sanctuary in Tabuk Island protected the town from the four meter high waves. Palumpon Environment Officer Raul Bacalia says the mangroves were initially put there to improve livelihood. Tabuk Island was declared a no-man's land to increase fish supply in 1996. After 17 years, people realized the importance of mangroves. Palumpon Mayor Ramon Oñate says climate change adaptation requires political will. We are serious in, 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 in doing those disaster preparedness para maano talaga ng tao. So it pays off. The town also improved its solid waste management program. We don't have garbage dump site in Palaupon. We have an eco park. Why? Because the biodegradable waste that you have noticed today and the non-biodegradable waste that you have observed in this area are not waste but rather raw materials for this one. For example, this one, this is a bioreactor. It converts biodegradable waste into organic fertilizer. Officials say what really helped Palumpon survive is its strong focus on environmental protection. Kung wala yung Tabuk Marine Park and wala po yung effort namin to protect the mangroves, ay wala na po talaga yung Palumpon. And this is the lesson that we have learned. Is we need a tangible example, a hard example, before people will believe you. So that particular video um, showed how some coastal towns around the Cloban and nearby island of Samar were actually protected uh, by, by the mangroves from the devastating force of Super Typhoon Haiyan. So in that particular lesson, what I am able to do, I believe, is uh, integrate um, geography with other subjects for upper primary, talk about something very personal, my ancestral place, talk about the impact of uh, weather, climate change, super typhoon, 
and uh, introduced the concept of mangroves, storm surge, and protection from um, from the devastating effects of of, typhoon, of typhoons. Um, if I take a look at this extract from Geographical Knowledge and Understanding, Scope and Sequence, Foundation to Year 10, this only covers until Year 6. Um, as I said, I was uh, wanted to use that particular lesson for upper primary, so I could actually target it for those in Year 4, Year 5. We talk about place, we talk about, for example, uh, how do people and environments influence one another, how do people influence the human characteristics of places and the management of spaces within them? And then how can the impact of bushfires or floods on people and places be reduced? So these are the key inquiry questions that, if you remember, I had some other questions that I wanted to investigate. So um, these are some of the things that, that, um, that, that can be explored with that particular example of a, of a geography sequence in which I use uh, something very personal from my perspective. Um, we go now to the very last slide for this particular lecture, right? and uh, once again, I invite you to, to consider these three types of reflection. Initially, the point of reflection and action, w were there any surprises? Uh, the role of a critical friend that I play together with the teaching team of EDSS, our goal really is to provoke you with, with new information that will hopefully force you to rethink uh, your beliefs in relation to teaching and to education. So I deliberately showed you pedagogical practices, um, how teachers view these. I also showed you information about teacher characteristics and their relation to pedagogical practices. Purpose was to try to elicit uh, surprises uh, on your part. So first reflection question, were there any surprises? And then I'd like you to step back a bit and, and think about this particular lecture that we had in relation to the first lecture. First lecture talked about the importance of humanities. This second lecture talks about teaching geography. And what I tried to talk to you about was what good teaching is all about, and I gave you a sample of what I believe, what I thought would be somehow good example in integrating subjects and putting relevance and introducing students to a different part of the world, particularly Asia. So we can look at reflection on action. Upon recalling this lecture, what are some of your insights or questions? And of course, our, our ultimate goal is for all of us to become reflective practitioners. And uh, one of the points that I stressed in this lecture is the idea of teacher efficacy. So becoming critical reflective practitioners really increases our efficacy as educators. So this last reflection point, as I continue, as you continue your learning journey, what aspects or themes do you want to learn more? And that is the end of our lecture for EDSS 279-379. This is the second lecture. Thank you very much.